frogs have been on this planet for 200 million years. And during that time, they've evolved into an extraordinary array of shapes, colors, and sizes. They've developed like no other animal. They can live in water, and they can live on land. During their time on Earth, they've witnessed the rise and fall of many species. They saw the disappearance of the dinosaurs and the arrival of man. And there is hardly a river or a pond on the planet that hasn't been home to these amazing creatures. They were revered by the ancient Egyptians, and for many, they remain the object of modern-day celebration and devotion, such as this annual Frog Festival in California. They've also found their way onto the dinner plates of the top restaurants in Paris. For thousands of years, the Chinese have used frogs and toads for medicinal purposes. The same reason that the world's top pharmaceutical companies are now analysing them in search of cures for even AIDS and cancer. And this man, Professor Mike Tyler, is the world's most enthusiastic expert on these remarkable animals. He doesn't just study them and write about them, quite clearly, he loves them. And he fears that unless we act quickly, we will pollute our planet the point where we will lose these delicate creatures. Maybe this is the turning point that, that was needed, that a poor, humble little animal like a frog could somehow be supported by everybody, act as a catalyst for a movement to do what we've all been talking about for so long. Let's have a cleaner and better environment. Let's make it better for our kids and make it, make get better for all of the organisms with which we share it. And so what does Kermit tell us about the environment all the time? What does Kermit say? Well, he says not to pollute. Kermit says not to pollute. Absolutely right. Wonderful. In this program, the scientists they call the Frogman will take us on a global journey to discover the wondrous world of frogs. Collected over the past decade, these are the Tyler tapes. They are a vivid record of the Frogman's expeditions to many continents and many countries. And for us, a chance to experience the mystery and the magic of one of nature's most unusual creations. Just as canaries were sacrificed in coal mines to alert miners of the presence of deadly gases, frogs may well be another of nature's barometers, telling us that all is not well in the world. And if we ignore their early warning signal, mankind may soon suffer a similar fate. All around the world, the same thing's happening. And it's not just in polluted waterways. The frogs are also vanishing from what appears to be pristine wilderness. Even in the remote, World Heritage listed wet tropics of Northern Australia, the symphony that has been sounding for millions of years has suddenly stopped. But at the beginning of human history, 3,000 years before the birth of Christ, it was a very different story. Frogs were so plentiful in ancient Egypt that they became a symbol of fertility and all that was right in the world. I was delighted to discover that 5,000 years ago, at the frontier of recorded human civilization, there are references to frogs. And during the regular flooding along the Nile, when it was a free-flowing river, the region became so full of frogs, they almost drove the locals mad. In the Bible, there's an account of a plague of frogs that emerged from the Nile. It took place in about 1275 BC. There were frogs everywhere. There were frogs in the houses. There were frogs in the beds. There were frogs in the boxes in which they made the bread. It was heaven, but the locals didn't think so. Eventually the frogs died, they put them together in great piles, and the piles stank. 
In the last few decades, medical scientists have been confronted by new and more deadly diseases than ever before. The search for cures for AIDS, cancers, and antibiotic-resistant bugs has meant millions of dollars and thousands of hours of research in labs around the globe. Just a few years ago, the Frog Kingdom revealed it contains the key to solving some of the medical nightmares that are confronting humanity. And one American scientist has discovered chemicals in frogs that could well be the new wonder drug of this millennium. I came to the Philadelphia Children's Hospital to talk to Professor Michael Zasloff. In many countries, the frog is used to some extent to treat infections and in almost every practice uh, whether the country be Africa, uh, South America or uh, within rural parts of the United States the practice is to take a living frog and use it almost as a bandage. A living frog is placed in contact or strapped in contact with a wound generally for several days and the frog may even die strapped to the wound and the wound is seen to heal. Uh, we now know that what must happen is, or at least I guess what must happen is, that under the stress of being strapped to a patient's skin, the frog secretes these chemicals and those chemicals help the healing process. Michael has produced a powerful batch of antibiotics known as meganins extracted from frog skin. He and his team have been performing routine surgery on frogs to remove their eggs when he noticed something very unusual. After the surgery, these animals were put back into their tanks. Uh, first, of course, we had sutured them surgically. One day, uh, after having done that sort of procedure for many years, it struck me that these animals we had operated on and put back into their relatively dirty aquarium water never became infected. And the wounds, as you, as you can see, Michael, are really rather dramatically uh, unremarkable. If this were man, a human wound, it would be a miracle. For thousands of years, the South American Indians have been aware of the chemicals contained in frogs. These living jewels, found only in the rainforests of Costa Rica, contain some of the most toxic poisons known to science, which are used by the Indians to tip the darts fired through their blowpipes. They kill many more types of organisms uh, than do the traditional antibiotics. They kill bacteria, they kill yeasts and fungi, they kill the organisms that cause malaria and sleeping sickness, and they kill certain malignant cells and, in fact, certain viruses. And they are the antibiotics, in a sense, that the frog has evolved successfully over hundreds of millions of years. And they are an other solution that, in a sense, nature has produced for us to deal with infection. In the 200 million years that frogs have been on the earth, they've had to cope with dozens of drastic climate changes. They have survived through ice ages and heat waves. They have seen the seas fall 200 meters and the heavens rain showers of meteors. Through it all, these incredibly diverse creatures have survived and thrived. It seems wherever there is fresh water, there are frogs. But suddenly, in the last 20 years, just as we were beginning to discover more and more about these amazing amphibians, scientists from around the world have discovered something unexpected. These great survivors are disappearing at an alarming rate. The golden toad has gone forever from the rainforests of Central America. 
so too has the platypus frog from Eastern Australia. This animal, also known as the gastric brooding frog, stunned the zoological world when it was learnt that it swallowed its own fertilised eggs, switched off digestive acids, turned its stomach into a uterus and gave birth to fully formed frogs through its mouth. Well, how does that help us, you might say? But remember this, at the time it became extinct, it was being studied because of its relevance to stomach ulcers in humans. Frogs have been around since antiquity and uh, have been eaten by people since there have been people and frogs on this earth. And we have records of the Romans using frogs as a delicacy. And we have been using frogs as food since time immemorial. And we are still doing the same thing. In Louisiana, in the deep south, I'm afraid that's exactly what would happen. Down here, they learned their bad habits early from the French. And Dozier Lester is a frog-eating, fifth-generation Cajun frog fanatic. All right, I have the breeding tanks where the frogs, male and females, together, live and call and breed, and they lay the eggs. I take the eggs and put those in incubators. And in the incubators, they hatch. After they hatch, they grow to a certain size, and then I put them in above-ground swimming pools that I use for uh, my tadpoles. And from this, they go ahead, and I feed them in this, try to maintain the water, aerate, clean, and as they approach maturity or when they begin metamorphosing, I take them out and put them in little metamorphosing areas where we're trying to teach them to learn to eat. But Dozier has had as much success with his frog rearing program as trying to teach ravens to fly underwater. Throughout the world, frogs are eaten in their millions. Rarely do they get a chance to retaliate. But this is one that will bite for the hand that reaches Ooh. for it. Just down the road from Dozier's farm is the once proud frog city of rain. We decided to paint frog murals because the town is a dying community and we decided to try to do something to revitalize it. It was the center of the frog industry many years ago, so we're painting frog murals all over our town. And now the frogs are dying because there are no locations that they can have a habitat. The rice fields are being polluted, our chemicals are destroying our frogs. So we're painting pictures on the buildings to revitalize the frogs in the city of rain. They say that frog enthusiasts are a strange and eccentric bunch. I can't think why. Jerry Marantelli's suburban frog farm in Coburg in Victoria is just one attempt to turn the tide of species decline. Oh, this is that's an beautiful. This is an adult corroboree frog. Here we find the brilliant northern corroboree frog, the endangered southern bell frog, the tiny southern toadlet, and the Mount Bawbaw frog, not to forget the great barred frog, the brown frog, and the red-eyed tree frog. Maybe the neighbours might be a bit more dubious about Jerry's fly and cockroach breeding programs, but what the hell, the frogs have got to eat. Unfortunately, as a scientist, I have to say that breeding frogs in captivity is in itself no answer if we no longer have an environment fit for the animal's return. For years now, just like Jerry, I've been successfully breeding and raising frogs in my laboratory at the University of Adelaide. Here, in the most unnatural, sterile and artificial conditions, the frogs thrive, whereas they die in their native state.
That's not true, unfortunately, of one species, Buffo marinus, the cane toad. He will undoubtedly be the last amphibian left standing. Public enemy number one. Yeah. But back to Coburg. And whatever else he might achieve, Jerry has at the very least managed to orchestrate the return of the delightful sounds of the Frog Symphony to one small corner of suburban Australia. It's a lovely sound. Oh, it's fabulous. For that alone, we must applaud his efforts. of North Queensland is the former cattle property Riversley Station. The parched rolling hills are not the sort of place to find frogs. But this area was not always arid. 20 to 30 million years ago, lush rivers and dense forests were home to thousands of frogs, as well as huge emus, wombats the size of a VW beetle, marsupial lions and giant kangaroos. Now their fossil bones are entombed in the grey limestone boulders. Okay, I'll try and wedge another chisel in. Sorry. To rescue these and other prehistoric right animals, the rocks have to be broken up and ferried to a rail line for transport to Sydney. Riversley can be deceptively quiet, much like it must have been all those millions of years ago. The tent city of scientists and volunteers wakes up for another day of discovery. This is serious business, and the fossils are found at an amazing rate because Riversley is one of the richest fossil grounds in the world. In a cave at Riversley, so big you could put the Sydney Opera House inside it, lives a colony of bats. The bones from their meals have fallen to the floor. Over several thousand years, they've mounted into a massive pile. I visited the cave with the bat expert, Dr. Sue Hand, keen to see if I could spot any frog bones amongst the bones. What's the chances of finding a frog in here? Uh, pretty good, actually, uh, particularly the limb bones, the, uh, the leg bones. I didn't eat the legs. Well, they tended to drop them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that, what that says about their preferences. <laughs> And to make it all worthwhile, amongst the bones that we found there, amongst the kangaroo bones and others, is one of a frog. But to look at it closely, we're going to have to go into the laboratory. In Sydney, the rocks are placed in vats of acetic acid. The rock dissolves and the fossils remain in the sludge at the bottom. Washed and dried, they look like new. From that one tiny bone, it was possible to identify the donor frog, an example of the remote froglet, which would have been caught by a bat beside a nearby river. Those of us who study frogs 
get to venture into some of the Earth's most beautiful environments, the rainforest. But somehow, the beauty and serenity of the habitat often makes our business here an even sadder one. In this deep forest tranquility, in the sound of water on stone and wind in the leaves, something is missing. There is no frog chorus. For any frogman, the silence is deafening. I'd been there, I'd seen the frogs, I'd seen them in large numbers. And then when you came back and there was nothing there, everything was silent. Yet the, the whole bush was the same. It was just the same as you'd left it before. Well, Keith MacDonald, a fellow frog researcher working in the rainforests of far north Queensland, it was a depressing experience. A new frog species one day, and gone the next. Even worse, they had seemed so common, he hadn't got around to taking a photograph. We just simply don't have one. We didn't take the photograph. Why not? People didn't expect frogs to disappear. And because they disappeared so suddenly, it was, we weren't prepared for it. For frogmen like Keith and myself, this is our worst nightmare. Not least because the environment appears completely unchanged, except for the silence. This is to all intents and purposes pristine rainforest. So whatever happened here, it certainly challenges one's so-called scientific detachment. Well, it's disbelief at first, and then shock, and then, you know, it, it's incredulous that, you know, how the hell and where the hell did these animals go? Why did they go? And um, as a scientist, you're supposed to be objective, yeah. but the emotionalisms come into it. You know, you can't be unaffected by the declines, the disappearances. What's needed, of course, is more research. And for that to happen in any effective way, what's also needed is funding. We have a crisis in the frog world. In Australia, 29 species are in serious trouble. If we don't have 29 scientists in Australia working on the problem. There are a lot of sperm, yeah. They're starting to activate So far, the gallant few burning the midnight oil in their lonely laboratories have come up with a number of theories. From the stress of a disappearing habitat to the effects of weed killers and insecticides and in 1999, the identification of a killer fungus. I suspect that all these theories are probably true, but this is a massive and complex problem which will require many solutions. Remember those canaries the miners took with them down the pits? Perhaps the frog deaths are an early warning for us. Central America stands a forbidding concrete fortress which houses the Bank National. Deep below the bank is a heavily fortified vault of gold. Not nuggets or ingots, but artifacts. More than 500 years old, these exquisite objects were crafted by the local Indians. They molded many sorts of animals. Crayfish, crocodiles, bats, turtles and frogs. Why anyone would want to wear an effigy of a crayfish or bat defeats me. But wearing a frog I can understand because I often do. It's a perfect place for reflection on just what is happening to our frogs. The real golden toad of Costa Rica is one of the world's most famous, but it too has gone from its home here in the mountain clouds. 
frogs have been one of nature's success stories, but now their very survival is under threat. They need our help as never before. It is in our own interest to come to their rescue because of the possible benefits from the use of chemicals in their skin as drugs. We share the world with frogs, and the frog chorus is the sweetest sound this side of extinction. If the frog, one of nature's success stories, cannot be saved, what hope is there for us?